All right. Here's our model of the great year. Here's our present position within this cycle. When we turn the clock back into Taurus, we find the dawn of historical civilization. We find the emergence of Egypt. We find the emergence of Samaria, all the rest of the ones I've been talking about. When you back up through the age of Gemini, through the age of Cancer, we get to the age of Leo. Beyond the age of Leo is the age of Virgo. From here, from Virgo to Libra to Scorpio to Sagittarius to Capricorn, all of that, we're back in the Ice Age, the depths of the Ice Age. Right here at this cusp, right on the opposite side of where we are now within the cycle, 12,900 years ago, give or take a century or two, is when whatever it was happened, and it altered the whole balance of nature. And the whole process took roughly 2,000 years. It was concentrated within the age of Leo. By the time we get out of the age of Leo, the modern world is, is, is very close to taking shape. So if we started going back, let's say we started creating maps of the world, each age, each astrological month, we would discover only minor changes through these five ages right here. But when we get to the age of Leo, from here to here, it, the map changes drastically, drastically. The whole geography of the planet was rearranged from this point to this point. And according to some estimates, it was the most severe event that has transpired on our planet in over three million years. And our barometer for that is the number of animals that disappeared. Because essentially, one of the consequences of these events that occurred in the age of Leo was that the top of the food chain was decapitated. And we lost most of the great mega mammals of Earth. The woolly mammoths and the giant ground sloths and the on and on, this incredible bestiary. I don't know if any of you were at the last Saturday night presentation I actually gave on the, the amazing bestiary that, that inhabited the world back in the Ice Age and was lost during this age of Leo. But the thing we have to understand here is that, and here's an example of it, all of this knowledge has been preserved for us and transmitted down through the ages through these various venues of symbolism and ritual and architecture and so forth. Here's the Tarot card, the Wheel of Fortune. You now understand that the Wheel of Fortune is referring to the Great Wheel, which is the Great Year. This, the cycle, the turning of the Wheel of Fortune is essentially the turning of that wheel right there. And the recognition that as this wheel turns, there are certain susceptible or vulnerable points within the sequence where the possibility or probability of something happening is multiplied tremendously beyond the normal background probabilities of something extreme happening. And that's what we have to grasp here, is that ancient peoples preserved a big part of this doctrine about the world ages. Because as we begin to look now at what science is, un unbeknownst to modern science, they've totally confirmed the ancient knowledge, which is that there is a discernible periodicity within this cycle. There is not an absolutely given that something is going to happen. But what it is, is that there are these vulnerable points, these susceptible points, where for a short period of time, the danger amplifies considerably over what it would normally be in normal times. So it's just like if you're living out on the coast of Florida, you know that there is a hurricane season where the possibility of getting struck by a hurricane is greater than it is for the rest of the year. Same idea, but on a larger scale. And once we realize that global environmental changes on this scale occur according to this periodicity, we are then in a position to assess whether or not we need to respond to that. And I think the answer is, is that 
certainly, if we, the human species, are going to grow up on this planet, this is a major part of it. This is a major part of our growing up, is coming to terms with this reality of the planet we live on. Because right now, the vast majority of the six point whatever billion people on this planet is totally consumed with things that in the long range will have absolutely no consequence whatsoever. And who is looking at this? Out of the sum total of the human population on Earth, how many people are looking at this and recognizing what it is and what it's implying to us? Well, we could, we could dismiss it by saying that well, this doesn't apply to us because it's on such a grand scale. Well, the problem is, is that when you begin to look at the evidence, the evidence suggests that if we go back for the last 150,000 years, we're going to make a discovery, and that is that the longest interval of time at which a global catastrophe has not happened, the, in 150, let me repeat this so you get it, in 150,000 years, the longest period of time at which a global catastrophe has not taken place is the one we're in now. Now, does this mean that we're supposed to basically give up and, you know, think that it's futile and, hey, let's just party till doomsday? No, that's not what it's saying to us. What it's saying to us is that there's no reason why ancient peoples would have found it incumbent upon them to invent multiple avenues to preserve this information if the information was just going to be an exercise in futility. Why, why not just go ahead obliviously along and enjoy ourselves until the next catastrophe comes along and not worry about it? Well, I think what the ancients had in mind was that once we understood the mechanism involved is that there is an appropriate response to it. In the same way that if you're going to build a house, if, knowing what we now know, if you're going to build a new house and spend 300000 or $400,000 building a house on the coast of Florida, you should take certain precautions, right? It doesn't mean we should throw up our... Because there's a hurricane that might hit Florida or a tornado that might hit Atlanta, doesn't mean we throw up our hands in, in, in a gesture of futility. It means that we do certain things. Like when I build a house, I take certain precautions. I, I use hurricane straps, for example. When I use hurricane straps, what that means is the roof on a house might withstand 150-mile-an-hour wind. Now, why do I take that precaution? Well, that's, that's the way I like to build things. I like to think that if I build something, it's going to be here generations from now, right? Well, we have to sort of adopt the bigger view as a species, and that's kind of what my message is all about. We have to take the long view if we're going to survive. And the problem is, is that humanity has been sort of hypnotized. The vast majority of people around us are essentially sleepwalking, and they're hypnotized by mainstream media and all of these distractions of pop culture and all of the stuff that, that just complete trivia that we're just drowning in, this sea of trivia. But what it's going to require is perhaps that 1%. I'd like to think it's more than 1%. I'd like to think maybe it's even 5% of the people who know that there is a condition of being awake. And that means that we are looking at the big picture, that we're going, okay, it's not enough for us to just think about ourselves. We've got to be thinking about our children and their children and their children. Now, maybe and probably the next global catastrophe will not occur in our lifetimes. I'd like to think that. But if it doesn't occur in our lifetimes, how, what's the probability increase that would, it would occur in the lives of our children or their children? Now, if we do something here and now that can change the odds, don't we have a responsibility to do it? And if the first step is just becoming aware of this, I would say that that's an important first step to take. But when you follow the ancient wisdom to the next stage of unfolding, you realize that they have preserved for us a plan of response. They have outlined, they have through their architecture, through their rituals, through their ceremonies, through their symbolism, they have essentially encoded and sent down through the ages and through the generations the set of specifications and the blueprints that we need to respond successfully to this greater phenomena that is going to affect this planet again, as sure as we're sitting in this room tonight. They did that. And they went to extraordinary lengths to see that this was done. 
And so when we turn to these many esoteric traditions, what we find is that there are key elements of this knowledge showing us here's the problem, here's the solution. It's not just about defining the problem, it's also about opening our consciousness to the solution. And the solution definitely starts with a change up here and a change here. That's where it starts. Because once we realize that we've got a bigger challenge ahead of us than all of these conjured up, whatever they might be, the war on terrorism or Islamofascism or whatever the, uh, the enemy du jour is, it's not us. We're all in this together and we're all facing the same challenge. And if we're too busy fighting each other, we're going to miss the big picture. And that was what the Hopis tried to tell us in their myths about the four worlds and the destruction. In the Hopi myths, there were, just like in the Mayans, there were four worlds preceding this one, and each one was destroyed in a great catastrophe. And always the cause was the same. Human beings forgot the plan of the Creator. They forgot to pay attention to the big picture of what we're here for on this planet. And our appearance on this planet is not an accident. Our appearance on this planet is part of our cosmic mission, if you will. And part of our cosmic mission involves restoring the primeval harmony that got lost. And this is the key insight that is gained from studying the, the traditions of the fall of man. That's what this is pointing to. We've all heard of this, the fall of man, the expulsion from paradise, the expulsion from the garden. There's many variants of this theme all over the ancient world. Well, the fall of man is referring us to, within there is encoded the specifics about what happened. What happened to this former lost age, which in some, rep in some representations is referred to as the Golden Age or the Silver Age. We're now in the Iron Age, the basest of those ages, where you have quantity rather than quality of consciousness. Now, the secret of alchemy is that you can affect a transmutation with a very small amount of the prima materia. A very small amount of the Philosopher's Stone can affect an extraordinary widespread transmutation. Well, on the human scale, a very small number of human beings, if they know the ancient secret, if they know the ancient art, can catalyze a transformation. And that is one of the great secrets of the ages. Jesus spoke about that secret when he said, at the end of the age, the secrets will be shouted from the rooftops so that all of those who have ears to hear can hear. And those who don't have ears to hear, well, they will not be fit as he said, for the kingdom of heaven. Of course, he's speaking metaphorically. Because what we're seeing here is a restoration of this primeval harmony between earth and heaven. And what we're seeing when we look at these after effects of these great catastrophes is what can happen as a consequence when this primeval harmony between earth and heaven is broken. It has consequences within the domain of terrestrial nature. And those are consequences we don't want to have to deal with. And we don't have to. I like to start, I always pick out a few good quotes that I feel kind of like sum up some of what I'm trying to do and what I think the great work over the years has been all about. And uh, this is one of them. 
that I find to be literally true over and over and over again as I go through and I learn. Uh, and I'm sure you've all read it. It's been up there about the last five minutes. But the thing I want to emphasize is the second sentence up there where it says, The remains of this knowledge are everywhere about us in everyday use and perfect. And uh, I find this to be literally true. And part of what I try to do with my programs is to communicate to people this understanding of how these things are manifest in the just the everyday world in, in ways that one even doesn't even begin to suspect. But they're there. And beginning to recognize the fact that there is a, a sacred component to our everyday life can be quite transformative when you realize that um, when you begin to ponder really how it ended up being there. So uh, the, the last line there, it says its revival will point to a restoration of the period prior to the confusion of lip. That refers to a kind of a universal tradition, but it's certainly pretty um, prominent within the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is the idea that, that there was once a universal language, and uh, this universal language uh, fell into disuse as a result of some kind of a catastrophic event involving the destruction of the, in the Bible anyway, it's the great Tower of Babel that they're building. Uh, and it was uh, appeared to the Lord that humans were going to achieve too much too quick. So actually, if you read the Old Testament account, it's pretty apparent there that they're talking about a plurality of gods. And they get together and they say, let us go down and there confound the tongue of man. Otherwise, he's going to be able to achieve anything, and he's going to become like one of us. If you actually go in and read the, the words in the King James, you'll find that, that, that the reference is plural. And it's quite uh, strikingly uh, remindful of when one reads some of the Sumerian accounts when the Council of the Gods were gathering to uh, determine the fate of mankind. In any case, that's what this is referring to, this idea that there was a universal language so what is the universal language? It's symbolism. It's, it's number and symbolism and form. And number, symbolism, and form are universal regardless of the spoken tongue, uh, which one happens to have been brought up in. And hopefully in the next hour, hour and a half, I'm going to be showing you examples of this so that you can see for yourself what actually the universal language of, of geometry and symbolism actually means. So there's a geometric link, a, a meteorological link. It appears that they're using the same system of measurement. And there's a geometrical link. Well, it's data like this that I think goes a long ways towards building a case that there has been some kind of a universal system at use in the ancient world. And these various cultural groups, whether it was the Egyptians or Sumerians or Mayans or the Hopewellians or the megalithic builders, had access to some universal system from some source that was outside their own cultural context. And I suggest that the source of that goes back into deep time that takes us back beyond the threshold of known history into the realm of mythical history which means we're going back like into the Ice Age, back into the Pleistocene, to use the geolog geologist term, back into the, to the deep recesses of the human tenure on planet Earth, uh, whose only memory has come down to us, not in the form of recorded history, but in the form of myth and epic story and legend and so forth. <clears throat> Because as it turns out, if we and this this is again is a is a good topic for the sacred geometry class, when we analyze Plato's description of Atlantis, of course, what do, what do you think we discover? Is that those numbers are embedded in in the proportions of Atlantis, as he describes it, the urban complex of Atlantis, and that to me is a strong hint that we're talking about something that goes way back, because the Plato basically gave the, sink, the date of the sinking of Atlantis as 9,000 years prior to Solon, the, the, Egyptian, the, the, the Athenian poet and statesman, Solon, did a 10-year exile in Egypt. And it was Solon that brought back the tale of Atlantis and presented it to the, to the Greeks. And Solon basically made that journey around 600 B.C., so if you add the 9,000 years to the 600 B.C., we come up with a date of about 11,600 years ago 
for Plato's date for the, 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 the demise of Atlantis. Well, it's very interesting that the date 11,600 years has been independently discovered by geologists looking at the tempo of various catastrophes that have occurred on Earth. And to those catastrophes is where I'm now going to turn. Catastrophes in the time of man, the tempo of global change. What I've done here is I put a time bar that goes from the present right here. This is us now. This is today. Right here is May 3rd at 4 o'clock. Is it 4 o'clock? That's right here. And this is 150,000 years ago. And the reason I used 150,000 years is that some of the earliest skeletal remains ever discovered of modern humans date back to 150 to even to 180,000 years. Skeletons that appear to be indistinguishable from a modern skeleton, which suggests that modern humans with presumably equivalent intelligence to our own were present on the planet at least this far back. And how far previous to that date, actually I've put this date at 144,000 years before present for obvious reasons, because I'm... Uh, I have an affinity for that number for some reason. So here we've got a 150,000 year time span. You'll notice this little red bar at the end. That red bar represents the span of recorded history, which is basically the advent of Sumerian cuneiform writing. So if it turns out that there were modern humans living through this whole span of time, why is there no history? Well, now you've got to do is turn to these various things that I've put on here. These are events that have occurred. And I used a certain criteria for these events. And here's the criteria I used. I began studying the record of geological change, climate change, environmental change. And I focused on events that could be considered catastrophic. And catastrophic to the extent that were an event of an equivalent magnitude to occur now, it would basically end civilization as we know it. That's the criteria I use. What would be, what would be the magnitude of an event that it would take to terminate our modern industrial civilization? That's the criteria that I used. And then I begin to search through the record of all of the events that would be of that magnitude or greater. And the events that I've found so far have been entered onto this graph, and they're listed all here. You can see them. And how many do we have here? And this is not complete necessarily, but we have at least 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 of them in 150,000 years. So at least 16 times in the last 150,000 years, there have been climate or environmental or geological catastrophes powerful enough that were they to occur today would essentially put us back into the Stone Age. Would essentially, if you think about some of the small catastrophes we have seen in the last few years, from the, the, the destruction of New Orleans to the great tsunami, you know, to some of the big earthquakes that we've seen, you know, New Orleans is still not recovered. But you've got to imagine what would happen if an event that was one order of magnitude greater than Katrina happened. By, by that I mean ten times worse. Let's say that we had ten cities decimated to the extent of New Orleans. We could certainly recover from that, but it would be a major effort to do so. Now what if we were talking about two orders of magnitude? Let's say, to put it into a rough equivalency, an event that could, could cause the decimation of a hundred major urban areas. Could we recover from that? Questionable. Now let's go three orders of magnitude. And now we're talking about the equivalent of a thousand major cities completely decimated. Okay, at that level, three orders of magnitude, that's what these are. Those are events that essentially would be three orders of magnitude. Once you begin to ponder this, it becomes apparent why there isn't 
a record, an extant record of what's been going on for the whole time that we humans have been here. Now, at this point, you probably haven't tied this in with what we've been saying before, other than I'll point out a few things to you that should be onset of the late Wisconsin Ice Age, 26,000 years before present. Remember the great year and the processional cycle? Cameron. Hmm. Add about 80 years to that, and we've got 26,000. Of course, 26,000 you consider a figure plus or minus a few centuries. Now, you come through that cosmic clock that I showed you, right? Halfway to the cusp of the age of Leo. 12,900 years ago, roughly. And what happened? We have something that happened. 12,900 years before present, onset of the younger, driest climate catastrophe, first phase of the megafaunal extinctions. Mm hmm. Let's. Now, here what I've done is I've entered some green dots. Now, look at the, what the green dots are. The green dots are basically derived directly from the model of the great year, based upon. Cycles of 6,480, 12,960, and then 25,920. And you'll notice how high of a correlation there is between the tempo of events, the actual events that have been derived by scientists without any reference to this great year model at all, and the timing of these ages of the world. Remember the 6,480 years, that was the, uh, the bull, the lion, the eagle, and the man. And according to the traditions, each of those seasons of the great year is inaugurated by some type of a great event, a transformative event, a catastrophe, if you will. And what I've done here is I have developed a data set that shows the correlation. It certainly seems from a study of this graph that these intervals, these event nodes as I call them, the susceptibility of something happening goes up exponentially for a short period of time. Here's the analogy that I have used. You're out driving along a quiet country road. You've got it on you know, cruise control. You're kicking back. You're listening to some tunes. You're not paying much attention. You know, you're talking on your cell phone. Not much traffic. Okay, now you come up to a major highway. And cars are <laughs> like this. Well, you're crossing that intersection, and while you're crossing that intersection, now suddenly you've got to put your cell phone down and start paying attention, because if you don't, you're going to get T-boned, right? Well, obviously, you've got your whole journey, and each time you cross an intersection of a major highway, you know, the potential of a catastrophe increases considerably over what it would be while you're out there on the lonely, the lonely country road. Well, you see, our planet is on a cosmic highway around the galaxy. And we're now beginning to understand the fine structure of the galaxy, and we realize that there is a pattern and an order to it. And there's a tempo of these orbital revolutions. There's a tempo of the galaxy. And there's a wave pattern of the Earth moving up and down, above and below the galactic plane. And within that, there are suborbital cycles as well. And we also discover that there seems to be a tempo in the delivery of cosmic matter to the inner solar system. It doesn't seem to be random. And this is going to be beyond the scope of today's lecture, but what I'm getting at here is that the evidence now supports the conclusion that the delivery of cosmic material and energy, the energy pulses that would be affecting Earth are non-random, that they are on some kind of a cosmic timetable, a cosmic tempo, if you will. And I think this is one of the most important insights we get from these ancient traditions is the measurement of cosmic time and how it relates to us here on Earth. Because when we go back and we look at these events, for example, the 12,900 year event, I mean, this was an event that, that 
I had identified probably 20 years ago before the date had been put on it. In fact, my friend and colleague Brad and I have been going on numerous expeditions to various parts of the North American continent collecting evidence for that particular catastrophe right there. Uh, as it turns out, that catastrophe of 12,900 years ago, North America was ground zero in the last great global catastrophe and last great global mass extinction. And so the evidence for this cosmic event is preserved in North America probably better than anywhere else on the planet. You just got to know what to look for and where to look for it. And it's kind of like the red pill thing that, that Cameron was talking about. Once you begin to become aware of it and you begin to see it, you begin to realize that the cosmic fingerprints are everywhere about us. We're in fact living in and upon the wreckage of the former worlds. The rubble of these former worlds is all around us, but we haven't had the scale of perspective to see it. And that's where we're at now. I'm, I'm completely thrilled with things like the emergence of Google Earth because Google Earth is now allowing us to just somebody, all of us, to sit at our computers and see the cosmic perspective of Earth. And when you look at it from, you know, from the, from the extraterrestrial point of view, things begin to show up that we don't see when we're right down here immersed on it so close that we're like ants walking on the rubble and can't, can't see what, what's around us. But we do see that we literally have built our own world and our own social system on top of and out of the wreckage of former worlds. And I, I mean, that's even in the most basic literal sense. You look at an urban area, you have all these buildings. The buildings are built out of concrete, aren't they? What's the main component that goes into concrete besides the lime of the, what's the main thing? Gravel, right? Well, what is gravel other than rock that has been pulverized, right? How does rock get pulverized? We can put it in big old powerful machines and pulverize it, but all over the planet there are gigantic gravel deposits, which are nothing but pulverized rock. And we go in and we, we quarry this pulverized rock and we turn it into concrete and we build buildings out of it. 